Malcolm Shabazz, the grandson of slain American civil rights leader Malcolm X, is dead. The detail of Shabazz's death is still unfolding, but the tragic irony is that the 29-year-old's life was cut short just as violently as his grandfather's. It's been well reported that Shabazz had a troubled life as a teenager, growing up in a single-parent home, the son of Malcolm X's second daughter, Kabila. But it seemed that in recent years he was finding his own voice. Here we see him gesturing in his famous granddad's likeness, not in that picture, but in one to come. But instead of following in Max Malcolm X's path of service, Malcolm Shabazz will be most remembered for having set the blaze that untimely uh, caused the death of his inspirational grandmother, Betty Shabazz. Malcolm Shabazz leaves behind his mother and two daughters. With details and to reflect on Shabazz, our guests are Bob Slade, author and host of New York radio station WBLS-FM, and Nayaba Arende, a reporter with the New York Amsterdam News, who broke the story of his death. We want to thank both of you for being here. Under, under a sad occasion, really. Very, very sad. Uh, uh, Arende, uh, Nayaba, Nayaba, you broke the story. What was your reaction when you heard about it? Actually, I cried. I heard about it um, about noon yesterday. Somebody from the West Coast, one of his friends called me and told me he'd been shot. And I said, do we have any details? He said, no, but I'm, I'm checking, but it's a reliable source. So I tried to get hold of Ilyasa, uh, Malcolm's uh, aunt. Um, I ended up going through Terry Williams because she had the number. I spoke to Ilyasa, who did not know. Um, and so the, 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 the thing began with people trying to find out. So the guy from California called me back a little bit later and said it's confirmed by the U.S. Embassy. Um, but then he said that he'd been thrown off a roof. Oh, goodness. Then it was he was um, beaten to death. Mm -hmm. So we're not sure what the details are. All we know is that um, he, he's, he's gone and it was in, in I think, Mexico City. Mm -hmm. His mother called me. She said that the family wants privacy. And she wants people to respect that, that you know, it's a private matter. She only just found out her son was killed yeah. that yesterday morning, and she just wants privacy. So it's, it's, it's been a little bit rough. It's very understandable yeah. that, that they would want privacy, but it is sure. such a tragic end uh, to, in some ways, a troubled life, Bob. Oh, yes, no doubt about it. And, of course, uh, his troubles began at the age of 12. Um, he was the one, he admitted that he set fire uh, to his mom's Yonkers uh, home. And uh, she... It's unbelievable. She, that happened June 9th, 1997. Uh, she suffered third degree burns over 80% of her body, Dr. Betty Shabazz did. Mm -hmm. And uh, she hung in there for three weeks until her death. Uh, he pled guilty, did 18 months, but he also had a troubled, you know, pass after that. He right. spent he about ran three years. Of the law. Exactly, yeah. uh, three years uh, in the penitentiary. Uh, for a crime, uh, and but you, you, my my immediate reaction was to flash back to 1965 and the assassination of Dr. You know, uh, Malcolm X, uh, and when when that happened, uh, I was I grew up in Harlem, so we, our reaction was like, oh, Hall of Harlem stopped mm -hmm. uh, because uh, of the death of uh, the assassination of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz, uh, who was a nurse at the time, you understand? Know, yeah, she got her doctorate later on. Mm -hmm. Uh, from UMass in education. Um, and she did a phenomenal, her life was just a, a turnaround, how she was able to survive the assassination. But she was at the Audubon Ballroom when he was gunned down, oh. covering her children. And mm -hmm. she was pregnant with twins mm -hmm. at the time. And how she was able to turn that around, it's just so tragic to see how it came out. And, you know, and um, Malcolm Chabaz is the son of uh, Kabila, uh, her daughter. And, uh, of course, uh, her, she had some problems, too, you know, mm -hmm. you know through the years with her being associated with, you know, they entrapped her in a case where she was going to assassinate Minister Louis Farrakhan back in the 90s, of course, and uh, that was all straightened out. And Dr. Dr. Betty Shabazz, uh, they, they made peace, and uh, she attended the Million Man March. Mm -hmm. We had uh, Dr. Betty on our open line show uh, in the 90s, uh, back in those days, and she was a marvelous woman, marvelous woman, and just a... Uh, you know, just a tragedy. You think about it, when something like that hits you, it's like hitting the family. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, Malcolm X is a, is a part of the fabric of the history of this mm -hmm. country, and so I think, uh, particularly in the African American yes. community, but anybody that believes in civil rights, absolutely. there's a connection there. And uh, I know that Nyaba, you were a friend of his, and although he had, you know, a, a very disturbing uh, uh, beginning in terms of coming to public knowledge right. with the, with the burning of his grandmother's house and then the run afoul of the law, he had begun to turn his life around and sort of take the mantle that his yeah. grandfather had left. He wanted to to be known as somebody who was influential and, and meaningful and um, a contributor to the community internationally. He did a lot of speaking around the country. Um, he was trying to develop, you know, the whole thing with the, with the fire. He said it wasn't quite as people thought it was and he was writing a book about it and we talked about that and that will come out later, I'm sure. But um, he just wanted to get his life together. But I think he was just, he was, he was followed by tragedy and, and troubles, and he, he was targeted a little bit, I think, you know what I mean, by the law enforcement, et cetera. And so he always felt that he was being watched and monitored, mm -hmm. and that notwithstanding, he, wanted, he has a, the do his daughters, he wanted to be a good father and, and be a powerful figure. That's what he was working towards, you know? Now, Yama, did you ever get the sense that he struggled uh, just living up to the name? A little bit, but I also think people, when they saw him, maybe not in New York so much, because in New York, everybody knew about the whole thing with Betty Shabazz. So New York's attitude towards him was a little bit different. He wasn't crazy about New York. But on the West Coast, there was a different kind of energy for him. Hmm. And so he, uh, he, he was very sort of, um, he was just a regular guy. He wasn't, he wasn't, you wouldn't look at him and think, oh, that's Malcolm's grandson. He was just a regular guy. But he knew that he had, to, he had this legacy to live up to, and he wanted to do that. But people were kind of like, some people wanted to be around him because he was Malcolm X's grandson. And he was trying to find his own sort of niche. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was struggling with, I think. How did they talk about it within the family? I mean, Malcolm X was an extraordinary person. And then, you know, the rest of the family comes wrong. We all want to be just ordinary people. Mm -hmm. So how did they talk about dealing with the legacy, uh, the, the pressure? I mean, I think it, it, the, the women are very, they're all very different. They all have their independent sort of avenues. Um, but whenever they were around Malcolm, they were always protected him. It was like you could actually see them physically come around him and like, okay, this is, you know, our son. Um, I, think, I think it was hard because everybody came at them with wanting something. And you never knew um, if somebody was genuine, I think, or whether they just wanted to show you love. And there was a lot of love in the community for him, a lot. You, put, you bring up a really interesting point about how we as women in the African-American community, we want to protect our sons. Mm -hmm. Sometimes so much we disable them. Do you think perhaps there was some of that where, where the family was, that impulse to save and protect didn't allow him to... No, I think he relied on that, actually. I think he wanted them to be... A, he, he needed them. And he was aware of how powerful that was and how much he needed his, his aunts and his mom. I don't think he ever rejected that or was ever... You know, that was part of his base. So whenever he went out in the world, he was out in the world doing his thing. But when he would come home, the, the women would protect him and, and almost, I did an interview with him at one point and, and he was late, it was an, an event at the Audubon. So we drove him up to the Audubon from Harlem and I saw one of the, the, the sisters and I said, I've just done an interview with him and she went, you did? And I said, yep. Mm -hmm. I know her and she was kind of like, well, what was it about? I said, it was just about his life and she, she automatically was like, well, why? And, I said, I got it, it's good, trust me. And it she was, went to make sure that... Everything was everything, and I understand that. Yeah. Right. And I always know how the, the girls are, the, the women are, and I always respect the, the whole thing with them. So, um, no, I think he depended on that, that base. I think he... What did we learn, Bob, I wonder, from this? I mean, it's such a tragic end to a, a life cut way too short, and his grandfather's life was cut too short. Is this a cautionary tale? How do we take meaning away from? I think uh, we go back to the term, which we don't really have anymore, and that's family, holding family close to you, even in times of trouble. Uh, there's a situation, you know, Dr. Betty was always um, protective of her children, uh, she was also extremely kind, and uh, she went through tragedy in her life. But she wanted to really make it a, a grab the family and hold the family tight and keep the family together. She tried her best to do that. Uh, young Malcolm was going, he was sent to her uh, when the house burned, uh, uh, when he set fire to the house. And he didn't want to go. But that's how she was. She was, you know, I, wanna, I, can, I can grab you, I can hold you, I can keep you with me. Trust me, stay with me, you know, and that's how she was. 
and, and she exuded that. When you met her, she, it was, she was like that. And um, I think that uh, the family is going to have to carry on, no doubt. Uh, and I think the family legacy will carry on. This is just a bump in the road, a tragic bump, mm -hmm. but we move on. Who will pick that up if not Malcolm Shabazz? Wow. It's funny. You know, it's funny, when, when he was at uh, family court, when he was 12, when he, when he uh, pled guilty to the um, juvenile delinquency, I got a ride with um, Percy Sutton, who mm. was the, mm -hmm. the family lawyer. attorney. Sure. Yeah. Um, we were going back from Yonkers to, to um, New York City. And one of the things that Percy said to me was, this boy is brilliant. He's so smart. And he said, and he gets it. I said, what does that mean? He said, he gets it. So when I first met Malcolm, I told him that story. And I was telling him about how I went to the family court to see you. And, and, he, and Malcolm was kind of like, yeah, OK, whatever. And I wasn't clocking. I didn't realize he, was, he wasn't really believing me. I said, and when you came out of the court, I was going to say, hey, Malcolm, we love you. But I was shocked into silence because you had this board around you and you were in shackles and you couldn't raise your legs to get into the van. And I was stunned that they had a 12-year-old in shackles. And then he looked at me like, yeah, that did happen. So then he, he was like, okay. And so I said, the thing that, that Percy said to me was, you get it. He said, yeah, you obviously say that to me. So now he, he opened up to me like, okay, mm -hmm. you're cool. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna let you talk to me about, you know, whatever. I think, I think the legacy of Malcolm will be continued because the community will, will, will make it happen. Absolutely. Matter of fact, next Sunday, the, the 19th, next Sunday, um, we're going to the pilgrimage, which we go every year to the graveside, and where Betty and Malcolm are, and we, there's a ceremony with Professor James Smalls and Leonard Jeffries and, and the whole oh, wow. Malcolm X Commemoration Committee. And matter of fact, I asked Malcolm to come last year. Because mm -hmm. I said, have you been to your, your, your grandfather's grave? And he, he couldn't make it. I was going to ask him to go again this year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then this happened, this unfortunately. Happened. Well, as Shala said, you know, his grandfather's legacy was bigger. He was bigger than life, and certainly the legacy will live on, Absolutely. and our hearts go to, on to the Shabazz family. Uh, uh, I want to always call you Arende. by your last name, which is Arinde Nayaba. Thank you so much, Bob Slade. It's always good to see you. Yeah, thank thank you, you guys for coming on. Thank we you appreciate so much. it. Thank you.